Good evening. As a preliminary matter, this is Town Council Douglas Heim. Permit me to first confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Karen Bishop. Ann Brown. Here. Michael Brownstein. Here. Elliot Elkin. Here. Carrie Fallon. Chief Julie Flaherty. Here. Jill Harvey. I'm here. I'm just um, making my dinner, so I'll be on screen soon. <laughs> um, Mona Motari. Here. Carlos Morales. Here. Bob Radosha. Here. Kathy Rogers. Here. Clarissa Rowe. Here. Sanjay Newton. Here. Susan Ryan Vollmer. Here. And Laura Gittleson. Here. Good evening. This is an open meeting of the Arlington Police Civilian Advisory Board Study Committee being conducted remotely consistent with an act relative to extending certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency, which among other things allows public meetings to be conducted remotely until April of 2022 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. I have four additional notes before we begin the meeting. First, persons participating by Zoom are reminded that folks may be visible, uh, that you may be visible to others, and that if you wish to participate, you are asked to provide your full name in the interest of developing an accurate record of the meeting. Two, further, all participants should be advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and participate solely by telephone. Those persons are not required to identify themselves or register in advance of the meeting and may not be visible on video. Three, all votes in this meeting will be taken by roll call. And four, finally, participants and folks watching can follow the posted agenda materials also found on the town's website. If there's nothing else, then I'll turn it over to the chair, Ms. Skittleson. Thank you. Um, so I will call this meeting, this meeting to order September 8th, 20, 2021 at 7.07 p.m. We should be recording, we are recording. Um, and so everybody should be aware of that. Um, I thank you all for getting here on so called packed agenda. And um, so I'm going to try to move quickly. I think we're going to move um, item three on the agenda up so that uh, the ta uh, so that Sandy and Karen don't get stuck here any longer than they need to. Um, I'm really happy that Deputy Town Manager Sandy Pooler agreed to talk to us. We had reached out to him uh, to talk a little bit about the collective bargaining agreement with the police unions in town. And when I touched base with him, he said that we really also probably want to hear from Karen Malloy, who's the town's director of human resources. And she very graciously agreed to join us, even though she found out about the meeting either last night or this morning. So thank you so much for, for being here. Um, I told Sandy that we have talked sort of peripherally about the fact that depending on what recommendations we make, there we were concerned there may be issues that would interact with or impact the bargaining with the police unions. And we had seen that when we studied other towns and cities. And so it seems like an important thing for us to know. And so I don't, I don't know, Sandy, did you just want to give a brief introduction and take questions, whatever, however you feel like this will go best for you? Sure. Um, thank you. Um, thank you for having me and Karen here. I think we're both uh, excited to talk to you. I've read your interim report. And um, like some of the other people have already said, uh, I thought it was very good. Um, and so I am impressed with the work that the committee is doing. Uh, I think these are important issues and figuring out the right way to get to the right solutions uh, is uh, it's gonna be a challenge, uh, but certainly consistent with the kind of, I think, progressive forward uh, thinking that I've seen my five years here working in the town of Arlington. Uh, so I would let me just explain a little bit about my role and about Karen's role in dealing with our, our unions. 
uh, Karen and I together as a team do the bargaining for the town. Um, and I have to say, um, I'm usually a little bit more the person on the financial side, whereas Karen is more the person uh, with 20 plus years of experience. Uh, and I think one of the leading HR directors in the state uh, of looking at the legal impacts and the um, kind of the history of our relations with our unions. Um, so having said that, I will start doing some of the talking just because you asked me to, but I do think uh, Karen and I have been in many rooms together talking either directly to the unions or uh, at various seminars and so forth, talking about uh, bargaining issues. Um, so I think we'll both have things to say and both be happy to answer any of your questions. Um, I know there was a request for our uh, collective bargaining agreements to be sent to you. I frankly don't know if those made it to you yet, but I would say, uh, regardless of whether they did, um, there's probably not going to be much in the collective bargaining agreements that's going to be relevant to the questions that you're, um, you're exploring. Um, partly that's because generally the things that you're talking about have not been uh, delved into within collective bargaining in the past, so there aren't particular uh, provisions. Secondly, because we work under a general rubric of a, uh, a contract with our unions. And, and as those of you uh, who have ever been in a contract or have, or if you're lawyers, you know that a contract is the meeting of the minds of two parties. In other words, both sides have to agree to the terms of a contract for it to be in that contract. And uh, fundamentally in labor contracts, anything that affects the terms and conditions of employment is subject uh, is a mandatory subject of bargaining between uh, the employer, a city or town, and our unions. So, what does that mean? Uh, in looking at the various possibilities for civilian involvement, in looking at uh, in discipline and uh, and particularly the rules under which our employees have to work they essentially have to come to agreement with us as to what those rules are gonna be. In other words, we cannot say, well, we want you to act in a certain way. Uh, there are some caveats to that, but in general, there has to be a, a shared agreement between us and our employees uh, within the collective bargaining realm under those terms and conditions of employment. There are some things that we can do where we can just go ahead and do something and uh, have what's called impact bargaining, uh, where uh, we have the right to implement certain things and then talk to the unions about uh, how that affects them. Uh, but uh, most of the things that I think we would be talking about here uh, are, fall under the category of decisional bargaining or, or decision bargaining where uh, again, you're kind of starting from zero within an agreement between the town and the unions. And you have to, to come uh, to a shared agreement about how things are gonna be done. Generally, I would say uh, the extent that there is any role in a uh, citizen panel reviewing or uh, imposing uh, discipline or in being involved with the particular due process rights of our employees to, uh, to be judged by their activity on the job, any changes to that would require an agreement from the unions as to what that would look like. On the other hand, if there were some sort of a general review by a citizen panel, sort of an ombuds person, uh, looking at, for example, discipline hearings over the last year and kind of commenting on how they thought they went uh, without getting into the particulars of an individual. Um, I think that uh, probably would be a legitimate area for somebody to comment on because 
frankly, anybody in town, any of you uh, has the right to comment on those things. Those records are public records. Um, anybody has access to them. And so uh, I, I think in that area, there is some, air, some room. Um, as I was talking to Laura early today, we were comparing our law school experiences. And one of the things that we both learned in law school is the phrase, it depends. So a lot of what uh, you may suggest, I think at some point, if there are particular ideas you want to uh, propose, certainly Karen and I are glad to offer our opinions, but I also think that we are willing and able to, uh, to consult with our labor council, ask labor council uh, what might be the case and, and give you some feedback on that. I will also say politically a uh, couple of things. One, uh, whatever gets proposed, uh, unless there is buy-in very early on from the unions, uh, even if they don't legally have a leg to stand on, they may raise some of their own uh, objections or they may contend that some of these things are uh, subject to bargaining. And that in and of itself may have to play out over time. I can't predict what that's gonna be. I can never really predict what the unions are going to do but that is often the case. Um, I think you asked me about collective bargaining, but I am gonna delve off into one related area. And that is, I think, and because I think it's related to the work that Karen and I do, and certainly is related to the work that the chief does. And that is the whole framework of accountability, authority, uh, and communication within the department any kind of outside entity that interferes with the chief's ability and the town manager's ability in a frankly very hierarchical structure to be able to impose discipline, set clear standards, but also communicate up and down uh, between the chief uh, and the unions. Uh, any interference with that, I, I worry could be deleterious to those relationships. That doesn't mean there can't be or shouldn't be a citizen uh, input. Um, I think that could be an important thing to do. But I also think I would urge you to think about what the relationships are of any organization um, and making sure that the authority of the chief is maintained so that she can do her job well. If at some point we think the chief isn't doing her job well, that's a question of whether we need a different chief. But if we do think the chief is doing her job well, it's important that we have structures that allow her to do that job well. Um, and so both in terms of her authority, but also in terms of people knowing that if she says the rules are a certain thing, that her employees know that that is the case. So um, that's just my, kind of related two cents because I would say that Karen and I spend a lot of time in our discussions with all the town unions, talking about communication, talking about those relationships, talking about the union members' sense of being listened to and respected and understanding who makes decisions and, and how that works. So uh, I would just say that's been an important part of our experience. Um, those, I think, are my opening remarks. Karen, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Uh, if you do, great. Otherwise, I think we'd be happy to take any questions. I don't have anything to add. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you so much for being here tonight, Karen. Um, I will, I guess, open it up to questions. Uh, Sanjay, if you can just keep an eye on the video for people raising their hands because I still can only see a small number of people. I see Clarissa has her hand up. Yeah, I see Clarissa, yep. Um, okay. One Go of ahead, the things, Clarissa. and hello, Karen and Sandy. One of the things that comes into play 
and I'm sorry I missed the last meeting when the Padrini case was underway is the evidence of case law in labor negotiations. And I think what has happened with the case law for complaints is something that this group should understand. I'm being somewhat obtuse. I think that Sandy and Karen know what I'm saying, but um, it would be great if both of you talked about the case law and what kind of you know, legal ramifications that has on our, or, or Julie, um, any of you talk about you know, what has happened in the past and how the town can bring a complaint against an officer and what kind of result we see we actually will have. Um, I think in general, what you're referring to is, is the fact that uh, both police and fire officers have the right to arbitration yes. over complaints and that arbitration uh, is a, a sticky wicket. <laughs> It is uh, unpredictable. Uh, it, uh, you know, we have sometimes done very well there and sometimes not done well at all. And in general, it is one of those things that I think all municipal employers try to avoid at all costs because um, you, you, it just crazy things can come out of it. Um, one of the things I think we have felt over the years is a dissatisfaction with some of the decisions that arbitrators have rendered, not solely in Arlington, but across the state. Yeah. Um, and so I think we uh, think that there is our feeling generally that there is a sort of bias toward employees among arbitrators um, and uh, that there is not necessarily, and I can say this from my own personal experience, a lot of attention, sufficient attention to detail or to the facts among certain arbitrators. Um, a lot of what we do when we go into an arbitration is a lot of education of the arbitrators for the arbitrators mm -hmm. um, because it's frankly extremely necessary. There is also, I think, a concern that arbitrators need to sort of split the baby all the time or uh, make sure that they are friendly enough to the unions so that the unions will continue to agree to hire them because right. when arbitrators are picked, there's a process where each side has to agree who the arbitrator is gonna be. Karen, do you wanna add anything else about arbitration? Um, I think that um, to Clarissa's question and uh, how nebulous you say case law is, right? So you have all these arbitration awards from these individual attorneys from individual uh, departments across the Commonwealth. One of the things I think I'm hopeful um, for in the future, is similar to how um, education reform created a centralized mm -hmm. place and certain standards for teachers, that started to build a library of cases or litigation where you could say, hey, look, this teacher, the, the termination was upheld for this reason. And um, I don't understand, uh, it's still in its formation, but my understanding is that with police reform, we have the hope of a similar thing happening where you, if you have standards and if you have the state involved in administering it, there could start to be, to take shape a set of decisions that everyone can reference instead of it just being up to your good luck that you happen to have a labor attorney that did another right. case in another town and through their network of people found out about some decisions in some other communities. Mm -hmm. does, that, does that make sense? It makes sense to me. I think one of the hardest things for people that haven't been involved in the town is how complicated this issue is. And as Julie knows and Sandy and Karen know, the labor issues really affect how we run the town and it's a very complicated subject and we're really lucky to have Sandy and Karen and Julie because it's much more complicated than the normal citizen would understand. And I under, only understand a tiny little bit of it now, but you know, I've been involved for a long time and it, I think it's, it does color how we deal with bad apples um, and how we've had to deal with bad apples as a euphemistic term. So that's, that's it for my 
question. Thank you, Karen and, and Sandy. Mona, did you raise your hand? Looks like no, but I see Carlos has his up. Okay, Carlos? Sandy, Karen, thank you for being here. Um, I have, you know, maybe it's two questions, but the first one is, um, it's the, the police reform at the state level. It's, uh, do you have any knowledge that does that has that trigger any, anything from the unions, right? To, to affect, you know, the, the bargaining agreements in some sense. And then the second question to that is, what, what, it will be, what is the difference when you have legislation at the state level changing <clears throat> some, some requirements about how things should be reviewed or so versus when you have maybe a town uh, by law that is changing, you know, something about like how, how things are done. So, so that's kind of like first one is, is that does the new uh, police reform at the state level, is that, you know, maybe triggering some, some bargaining agreement and what is the difference of like that review board sitting at the state level, a state law versus a, a, a town by law? Karen, do you want to take the first and then maybe I'll take the second? Sure. Um, I just want to apologize to everybody. I actually have another town meeting that starts at 730 and I, I'm disappointed genuinely because I would love to be part of this conversation. I'm enjoying it. Um, so, but I am sorry, I have to, I have to run to that. Um, no, not, not yet. Um, it, it may, but not yet. It, it's still, um, it's interesting. I think this winter I wrote down, you know, something that I was kind of like, okay, this summer we're clearly going to have to talk about a component of this, but it's still, it's for me anyway, in my experience, I would want the chief to comment on this. I haven't seen anything that, um, has been raised as a, as a subject of bargaining. Yeah, um, as in terms of uh, legal issues, um, I think the legal issue is, is, is fundamentally the contract clause of the US Constitution that if we have our collective bargaining agreements or contracts and, and we cannot uh, unilaterally alter those terms of those contracts through a local uh, bylaw. It's like, you know, one side of the, uh, of, of the bargain that's saying, oh, we're gonna, change the terms of conditions because we want to. Um, I think that is very difficult. Um, I think even uh, to some extent state law, uh, it, you then get into some trickier issues about if, if, if the legislature has created a, um, a kind of universe under which people have to act if there's an existing contract that's in, in, contrary to that, then what happens? That, that gets to what's what keeps lawyers busy. But I think uh, to your main point, Carlos, just passing a bylaw does not then in and of itself eviscerate uh, what's in a contract or obliterate our ability or our necessity to have to bargain with a union over something that might be in that bylaw. Does that answer your question, Carlos? Yeah, he, he's he's nodding much. approval, okay. and then I and I see okay. Doug's hand is up. <laughs> and Doug has a I see Doug has a hand up, so I'll call on Doug. Yeah, th there's one piece of that that I, I just want to make sure is, is clear for everybody, including for, for for Sandy and Karen. From my perspective, is that one of the big things that we're sort of it's tempting to overlook is that because the state is going to essentially create an accreditation process, if you're no longer accredited, there's an interesting legal question about whether or not your union contract or your civil service status protects you. Because what the state is saying is, this isn't a contractual matter. This is a predicate to serving as a law enforcement officer in the state of Massachusetts. And if they either independently through their review or they receive some internal affairs decision from Arlington or anywhere else that basically substantiates serious misconduct and they decide to pull someone's accreditation, um, it's an open legal question about yeah. whether or not they have any collective bargaining rights. I, yeah. I would say that probably they don't because it's not a question of the town saying you're fired. It's a question of whether or not you meet the prerequisites to serve as a law enforcement officer in Arlington, but it, it's not totally so. It's, yeah, it's not clear. So what that, that means, if Doug, you can tell me if this is wrong, is 
you could potentially, because it's unclear, you could potentially have a scenario where you could lose your accreditation but not lose your job. It's not clear. Yeah, I mean, I, it's not 100% clear. It would be hard for me to imagine that being the case in most other contexts, for example, nurses, doctors, um, speech language pathologists, people who work in schools, psychologists, you can't continue to work in your job if you've lost your accreditation from the state licensing authority. So th that'll be an interesting thing to watch unfold, but it's an important piece to understand that I, I just want to make sure everybody was, was clear on. That's probably the maybe the unsaid biggest game changer in terms of the impact on collective work. Thank you. Kathy. So to follow up on that, um, Doug and Sandy, is that a um, negotiable item in a, in a labor contract? My knowledge of labor law is, is, is minimal. I, I've, I've bargained against SEIU 615 for 20 years now successfully. So I have some understanding of how these things work, but could a provision that says, if you are no longer accredited pursuant to this new state law or, or, or state agency that you do lose your, your job. I mean, is that a provision that could be negotiated in a union contract? I would say, it, first of all, anybody, anything could be. Uh, what the union position would be, again, we'd have to come to an agreement with them on that. Um, I think the issue of whether somebody would then lose his or her job because of not being accredited I think is an issue that is still, it, I think that will be resolved around interpretations of the new state law as opposed to individual communities making that decision. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that that's something that we're going to need to come to grips with, frankly, um, or to try to bargain with the union over, uh, because I think it is likely to get to resolve itself either with legislative clarification or a, a case in another community and it will just become clear one way or the other. But that, um, but my concern is that in six months or so, or less than six months, the study committee has to make a recommendation. And we're depending, I think it sounds as though we could be depending on how this law is interpreted by unions, then by courts, and then go up to three levels until it gets to the SJC. It's a very long time to wait to see if there's a good result that could, in fact, eliminate the need for the purpose of this, eliminate the need for the whatever thing we're supposed to come up with. So I'm just worried about timing here. I mean, we have six months to make a recommendation, and it doesn't sound to me that a lot of these very key issues are going to be resolved by then? I, I would say as long as there is uh, ambiguity at the state level on this issue, I would see it unlikely that the unions would agree to any change. I appreciate so, your candor, Sandy, very much. That's a, that's a very important point that you just made, that they wouldn't. Because I'm going back to use, I'm going to use Clarissa's term that, that I thought was good. She said, how do we deal with bad apples? And that I think is one of the purposes of what this group is supposed to study. How do we deal? And I totally understand what you and Karen have, you know, very eloquently presented about, you know, there are real limitations um, here, but I'm still wondering how it is, how is it that we as the committee make our recommendations, appreciating what you have said but yet not abandoning the charge that we have and our responsibilities to the people of this community. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted Sandy's to add right. that um, my understanding is once an officer is decertified by the state, then they're not able to perform their duties as a police officer and they will not be eligible to be um, employed. That's my understanding. There are several um, committees and groups that have been formed to this point and there are several more and we're still uh, daily we're getting updates from yeah. the state um so i think it's that's you know we'll have to wait and see but that's my understanding that if an officer is decertified then they're not eligible for employment thank you and i think uh, kathy you are right to be worried about what we present to town meeting 
but the world is changing right now. We have to do the best that we can do. And I think our draft report is doing a really good job. We can't make the legislature do what we want in our time frame. They're just not going to. Um, we have a real advocate from Arlington who is working hard at police reform and she's working with the chief and she's working with Sandy and she's working with Karen and that's our state Senator Cindy Friedman. We have to give them a chance to do something statewide and we just have to be patient. We're doing the best we can and we can't have all the answers by town meeting in the spring. I mean, that this is the perspective of an old, of an old lady who's been in town meeting for a very long time. Well, with all due <laughs> due respect, Clarissa, right? I, yes, I, I don't think <laughs> I don't think um, uh, right telling town town meeting and the town to just be patient will be enough for for the work. No, of the it committee, won't be. Right? We have to do the best yeah. we can. We have to do our work but and I, I understand mindful that. being mindful of the changing landscape around us and being mindful <laughs> of the constraints exactly. on us, right? But but um, exactly. Just telling people to be patient, I, I don't think is. No, I'm not telling that. I don't believe people should be patient. Yeah. That's not my philosophy in life. Our, our, my philosophy in life is speak up. Yeah. And um, we should do that. Yeah. But getting town meeting to, pres we, are, we can't present something that's fully baked to the town meeting. We just have to accept that as part of what we're doing. Well, I, do I the think. Best job we can. Yeah, but I, I think at a philosophical level, right? nothing that we present to town meeting is ever fully baked, right? The world continues to change around us, the world, right, in, in, in all aspects. And, you know, what anyone presents to town meeting is their best attempt at the current status of the world, right? right. And, and so, right, our job is to present the best thing that we can to town meeting in the coming year based on the world as we see it now, right? And, and there's certainly room for us to tell town meeting, right? Here are the things that we don't know about what's going to happen, exactly. right? These are the things that may, you know, that are still coming. Um, right. And, and, then what, and, and then, we have recommendations that you should listen to. Yeah. And that, you know, what we recommend today may not be the right thing in two more years, right? In two more right. years, town meeting might have to make changes uh, or right. additional changes or, or things like that, right? I, you know, right. I, we shouldn't be so wedded to the idea <laughs> that um, what we create now is will be perfect right? That, that we get stuck in not doing anything. Thank you. Thank yep. you, Sanjay. Yep. Carlos. Oh, sorry, I see Carlos. Yeah. Yeah. So now that we're getting in, into some conversation about execution, you know, I, I, I would like to hear, you know, hear from Sandy uh, some thoughts about, hey, you know, say that we are, we are, we do our homework and we have, hey, I think this is the best that we can do for Arlington. At what point can we go, go around and talk to people in the unions or somebody out there to kind of like see what, what their response or, or is, is that even a strategy? So how, how do we get there? How do we talk to people? You know, I, I would say we first talk to you. It's like, hey, Sandy, this is what we're mm -hmm. thinking to propose. How's it gonna work, right? So we'll do that for sure, right? Yeah. But, uh, but how do you do? I mean, it's like, do you do a binding? Do, do you have to talk to, to, to uh, people in the union and say, hey, this is what we're trying to do uh, and explain ourselves, and you know, or rather than just the they, they hearing, it's like, oh, you know, there was a bylaw in town in Arlington that got passed. So how? Right. Um, so that's a very good question. Um, I don't have a simple answer for you. Um, I would say a couple of things to keep in mind. One, uh, if you're, uh, if the, if the town is talking to the unions, the town can talk only to the union leadership. In other words, we can't go around who the union president is, for example, to talk to the membership. And so we, within our role as an employer, are limited in, in our conversations. Um, I think you've raised an interesting question if at some point this group would want to get some input from the unions and what the best way to do that is. I think that's a question that I would, um, I would like to consult with Karen and Labor Council about that um, and get some, some feedback for you so that it's done in the right way. Um, I mean, I generally 
think talking to people is a good idea <laughs> uh, and gets better results. Um, I also, uh, but I, I think let's let me uh, let me get back to you on that for some specifics. Um, I think at the end of the day, uh, legally, uh, as long as what your recommendations are don't cross over into the areas that are mandatory bargaining, then if you recommend something that's just a change in the bylaw or you know setting up some sort of civilian feedback to the police chief or to the town or, or whatever, uh, that you don't have to talk to the unions. That the town can pass bylaws and, and do things like that. Um, but I think that's more a tactical question that you're raising is what's the best way to communicate with the, with the unions. And I think that's a worthwhile conversation to continue to have. Yeah. Thank you. Sandy, would it be possible for, for you and Karen, you, may, you might have to think about this, right? To give, to provide us a list of, you know, things that would be considered bargainable um, just so that, you know, I don't think that's something that we as committee members necessarily have an innate understanding of. Um, and with some yeah, understanding so. that, you know, that there is often disagreement about what is bargainable and what isn't. Um, well, yeah, th that you get into fights like that all the time. Yep. Um, so I would say as a general overview, if you are changing the terms and conditions of employment, that becomes bargainable. So if, so for example, the chief has rules and regulations, disciplinary rules and regulations. If you were going to try to change that by some recommendation, that would be subject to bargaining. The rules and regulations. Yes. So, uh, there are certain things that she can, but that basically those define the terms and conditions of people's employment. There are some things that she has management rights to change already. She can probably talk about what some of those things are. There are some things that um, nevertheless she would have, you know, like she can assign somebody to a particular shift or whatever, um, but there are other things where uh, certain, people bidding for shifts on an annual basis is subject to the contract. So there are certain ways, there are some things that she can do automatically under her management rights and some things um, she has to follow the contract. And the same thing with, with disciplinary proceedings. Um, there is a grievance procedure within the contract for if somebody has a grievance for a management action, how it goes up the line, that is written in the contract and you, once, uh, I, again, I don't know if you've gotten the contracts yet. I know we don't, I don't think we have an, a fully integrated contract, as we say. Um, over the years, we tend to have like a three-year memorandum of understanding that just deals with, you know, five issues and then the whole contract isn't rewritten. So I don't know that, I know Karen's been working on getting an integrated contract signed by both sides. And that's, that, that is a very typical issue in cities and towns, not having those integrated contracts. Nevertheless, um, I think there's something we can get you. But I, so just to get back to the whole disciplinary process is defined in the contract and it's very clear and anything that would change that would have to be bargained. Um, sure. On the other hand, I think hey. civilian review and comment on, um, on the department's disciplinary processes or, sure. you know, looking at the, there's been five cases in the last year and, um, you know, and this is where I'm gonna give you my opinion, subject to the caveat that before you take that as, as, as really worthwhile, we would talk to labor council about some of these issues. But if the, um, if a civilian committee said, hey, you know, we had five issues and, you know, it seems like the police department did a very good job of investigating them and they got the facts and they did their job and we want to say publicly that 
that we have confidence in what's going on, I don't think that's something that would have to be bargained. Okay. Similarly, if the committee were to say, we think that there are, uh, there may be need to do a certain amount of more work. I think that probably would not be bargainable. It then somewhat then gets into issues of if you're saying, well, four of these cases were fine, but when you dealt with Officer Sandy Pooler, you really blew it. Um, and because we think Sandy Pooler should be fired, that gets to be a little more complicated um, because then Sandy Pooler has due process rights, reputation rights, et cetera, et cetera. Even, even if the committee doesn't have the power to impose that, that condition, you're saying just offering comment on a specific case? I would, I would want to pursue that question in a little more sure. detail with Labor Council because I think it's, it's on the edge because okay. like you, Sanjay, as an individual, would have every right to say you should have fired Sandy Fuller. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing anybody can do about that. That's your right. Um, if there is a city, or excuse me, a town committee that has official standing and is making those kind of remarks, I think it starts to be a little bit different. And again, I don't, I don't, I don't think there's a bright line rule. I do think it's something that we should talk with Labor Council more about. Um, and I, you know, I think this can be an iterative process. In other words, if there's some things that you know that you don't wanna do, so we don't have to take up Labor Council's time yeah. with and yeah. avoid that. If there are areas where you think, well, we're kind of going in this direction, it might be more useful to try to limit the scope and, and not just talk about everything under the sun. Um, at the same time, you know, we can try to give you some general feedback as I have been doing now. Sure. I'm gonna, oh. I'm gonna sort helpful. of go off of what the question Sanjay just asked. So if, but if, if there was a hypothetical town body that was commenting on policies and procedures, but not on a specific officer's like actions about, about those procedures, is that in the bar in that iffy category, or is that different? I, I think that that is um, is much more on the on the side of something that you have every right to do. Thank you. Yep. The the other question I sort of oh sorry I see Bob has a question. I'll let him go first. Yeah. Um, am I on? I guess I am. Uh, I should know this, but I don't. How often is the contract negotiated? The one, two, three year kind of thing? Yeah, as a general matter, our labor contracts go three years at a time. Um, There's sometimes exceptions to that, but that's the general rule. Okay, thank you. So my second question was about, um, you know, a lot of times bodies like the ones we're considering deal with records, right? And have access to, to various kinds of records and of all kinds, right? And are, are there, would anything of that nature be something that would be subject to bargaining? Um, anything that is a public record, you have access to. So um, that would not be, uh, that would not be subject to bargaining. But, but right committees of various police committees often have access to much more than what is public record um and i see doug so has I his hand not, up too so that, that that's another area where i know what you're talking about um not knowing what the specifics are that and I, um but um it is my understanding that that now um Certain internal affairs documents are going to be our public records now under the um, under the new state reform. Uh, I have not had to deal with that, so I don't know all the details. Uh, on the other hand, there may be things that are in somebody's personnel file that would not be considered a public record, 
whether that would be turned over to a committee. Again, I think that's that's a question that deserves some conversation, but I don't have an easy, I don't have a pat answer for you on that one. Sure. Doug's, Doug's hand is up. Laura, I'm, yeah. I'm just calling on people since I know you can't see. Please, it. yeah, no, I sent you a message. I don't know if you saw it. Oh, Go no, ahead and take, yeah. take that over because I really, it's not getting better. Okay, sorry, yeah, go ahead, Doug, sorry. So if I can just contextualize something, both for Mr. Pooler and for, uh, for, for, the, for the committee, an interesting example is, for example, we heard from Mr. Kaur about Cambridge's civilian review model. So in Cambridge's civilian review model, the actual investigation is conducted by the professional standards division of the police department, just like it is here right now in Arlington. So presumably, although not certainly, you wouldn't have a collective bargaining right to say um, that the professional standards division is gonna do an investigation and somebody else is going to have more information about that investigation relative to the investigation itself. There's already an entity that's performing the investigation. So the collective bargaining issue isn't about how the investigation is performed or who performs it. It's really just about what information is conveyed and this uh, additional potential layer of um, hearing process that you might be subject to. In New York City, it's very different. In New York City, the Civilian Complaint Review Board of New York City has professional investigators that will interview police officers separate from internal affairs. And in that context, those police officers have a collectively bargained right to have union counsel present during those interviews. So just to contextualize it, again, it, it, I think what Sandy, what, what's a little bit difficult for everybody, the committee, for Sandy, is that there might be some pieces of it that don't have any impact on collective bargaining. Uh, our professional standards division conducts investigations. Cambridge's professional standards divisions conducts investigations. But in Cambridge, there's another sort of body that might receive that information. I think it's part of what you're talking about, uh, Sanjay. And in, 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 in New York City, on the other hand, you have a wholly different authorized entity that is actually performing the investigation itself. That would certainly need to be collectively bargained. That's a very bright line thing. But who, whether or not you have to bargain something for you know, uh, a, another body beyond the police command structure, the management structure, to just receive that information and talk about it is is a more is, is a closer question. Sandy, does that help contextualize it? Yeah, no, I I think that's exactly right, Doug. Are there any other questions, comments, rebuttals? All right. Should, should we go around and just make sure that people, right? I know sometimes people, and when we actually call on them, they have things that, that they didn't bring up. So Susan, I'm gonna call on you first. No, okay. I, I actually do have a question, but I, I don't wanna ask it because it's a can of worms. It, I'm gonna save it for another thing. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Michael, anything? Jillian? Uh, who else did we not hear from? Anne, maybe? No, I don't have anything. Thanks Mona. for asking. Yep, yeah, Mona and Elliot. I think we heard everybody else asked a question. Feel free to ask if you do, but I just want to actually ask people just in case. Thank you. Uh, if there if there aren't any other questions, um, I just want to say thank you, Sandy. This was, I think, really helpful in answering questions we have and making us think about maybe questions we haven't thought about in the past. Um, and I think there's a good chance we will take you up on your offer for follow-up or as a conduit to labor council if we have questions down the road. That would be great. I would say it took me, I've been doing collective bargaining for over 20 years now. So it's taken me over 20 years in labor law to be completely confused. So um, good luck to you. 
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Good luck, everybody. And again, I, I will be glad to talk to you more sometime in the future. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Um, okay. Um, I am going to go back up to the top of the agenda and hand it over to Sanjay for the minutes, the prior minutes. Yes, just give me one second to get them shared here. Uh, context switching here. Um, oh my God, do I need to even share them? Did, did anybody have any objections on the minutes that I circulated? I think I gave enough time for everybody to have seen them and had a time yep. had ten, yep. chance to look. Um, okay. Would somebody like to move that we approve the minutes? From yeah, Brad, move that we approve the minutes. Second. These are these are the August twenty fourth, twenty twenty one meeting minutes. Thank you. Would you like me to conduct a roll call? Yes, please. I'm sorry, I might not go in perfect order, uh, but I'm just gonna go in the order of folks that I see and then the chairs. Uh, Kathy Rogers? Yes. Ann Brown? Yes. Bob Radosha? Yes. Elliot Elkin? Yes. Carlos Morales? Yes. Mono Dadi? Yes. I'm sorry, Carlos, did I get you already? Yes. Okay. Um, Michael Brownstein? Yes. Sanjay Newton? Yes. Susan Ryan Vollmer? Yes. Laura Gibson? Yes. It's a unanimous vote. I don't think I missed anybody. Oh, Miss Rowe. I'm sorry. Miss Rowe, I missed you. Is that a yes? Unanimous vote. Thank you. Abstain. Okay. I was absent. Oh, okay. It's um, unanimous vote with okay. one abstention. I know that um, it's summertime, so I don't know how many of you representing different commissions and committees have met since our last meeting or have any updates, but I'll just go around and check with the people I see. Um, Carlos. Uh, <clears throat> no updates. Okay, thank you. Anne? No updates, we're meeting next week. So hopefully after that. Okay, great. Um, Michael. Oh, we'll be meeting September 15th. Okay, and Kathy. We meet in another week and our retreat is on Sunday. Um, I think the next okay. step for me is just to, when the report is finalized to share it with the group. Great, thank you. Anybody I missed? Okay. Um, I, the you missed, next you missed day... Susan. <laughs> no, oh, Su sorry, <laughs> Susan. Yes, we haven't met since the last meeting. Okay. Um, I am going to go ahead and uh, actually turn it, turn our, uh, Turn the meeting over to Susan now because she is really the one to talk about the next three items on the agenda. So uh, Susan, go ahead. So the first item is um, just adding a little chunk to the interim report about the um, information that we collected on how civilian complaints about police interactions can be filed in town. We had heard from Chief Flaherty in our second meeting in April, and then we also heard from Kathy at a meeting in June where they both described processes. So I, I apologize for not getting this done sooner, but um, I drafted something and just in concept, if, if folks um, agree with what was sent out, um, we don't have to definitively approve it this evening. We can certainly make uh, little minor editorial adjustments as needed as we did with the full interim report the last time. Go ahead. yeah, Kathy. 
So I just wanted to say, I, I'd like to be able to check the statement um, with leadership of the Arlington Human Rights Committee. Am I pretty sure that what I said in June is accurate? Yes, but I never, I never ran by them those words. So if I'm in error, I want to catch it yep. before the report goes public. So I need a few days to be able to reach out to leadership um, and, and, and clarify that or amend it as necessary. That to me sounds like a potential for a little more than tweaking. Um, okay. uh, Susan, I just, I just didn't want to mislead the, the study group. Okay. Um, it, I don't know, has anybody had a chance to look at it? I know I gave you like five minutes. Okay. So um, we're meeting again in two weeks. Maybe we can determine that then. I think that sounds reasonable. I did have that sounds I, good. I did have a chance to read it, and I had one small tweak. Uh, where was it here? Uh, there's just a section where. Oh, we, you mentioned that the there's an ordering I'd like to change. You mentioned that the the bylaws of the Human Rights um, Commission, or sorry, that their website does have something about bias, but not about police. Um, and not explicitly stating that they can receive complaints about police interactions. I think we should just reverse the order of those two paragraphs to clarify what, what's being said. Okay. Um, and um, I, but, Sorry, before, before I give back, I, I just wanted to thank you for, for thinking of this and, and for, for doing it, because I think this is actually a really big part of of our work and and I think it's important that we put it there so yeah it's noted in the charge and I, I can't believe we all missed it the last time <laughs> but anyway so we'll get that in and obviously Kathy needs to review it closely and Chief Flaherty needs to review it closely because it's a summary of presentations that you both made to the board um so we can move on to the next item if there's no more comment on this item um, the next one is our plan for um, soliciting input from the public about the work that we're doing, which is a topic that has come up um, probably the last three or four meetings. And so um, I just thought about the many comments that people have made over the last few meetings, and I think I can summarize it into we have four tools that we can work with, and I'd love to just run through the four tools that we can work with um, and if folks agree on the strategy implement it over the next two months um, so first our committee has reps from envision arlington standing committee envision arlington diversity task force human rights commission rainbow commission disability commission board of youth services and council on aging i think and we can solicit input from the um those commissions and by extension, the communities that they represent in a fairly structured process. Um, first, uh, each of us who are, come from a commission can share the work we've completed thus far. Um, one of the things that, that we're going to be doing, we're trying to get time on an upcoming select board meeting to present the interim report. Once we have that presentation done, that's a tool that can be used by everyone on this committee who needs to go back to their commission to report on the work. So um, you can report on the work and then you have a context through which you can then ask two questions that we previously agreed on, I think in an August meeting, which is the first question, consistent with the historic mission of your commission, what information do you believe it's important for the Civilian Police Advisory Board Study Committee to understand about the community that you represent? And what are your hopes and expectations for the Civilian Police Advisory Board Study Committee. And that seems like a fairly structured, straightforward way to solicit input. Then it'll be up to your commission to decide how they want to give that input. Do they wanna just write a memo and send it to us? Do they wanna say, oh, let's hold a meeting with some of our community members who are particularly active and summarize what they say. And, um, but that's something that we can leave up to the commission. We don't need to try and control or direct that process. We just need to provide a structure. Um, second thing we can do, and I think Anne and Karen and Michael have really brought this up repeatedly, is um, listening sessions with other constituencies in town who aren't represented on our committee. Um, 
So this would include members of the faith community, veterans, immigrants and refugees, police officers, people who live in public housing who were originally supposed to be represented on the committee but aren't. Um, and possibly, and Jill, maybe you can provide this information. Um, I don't know what language would be like the second most language that people in town speak, but we might, if we might need to hold at least one listening session in whatever language that is. I don't know if that would be Spanish, Cantonese, Mandarin, whatever, um, and figure out how to do that. Um, and, to, and to do that, I would really ask for volunteers who might want to be interested in sitting in on some of these sessions. And again, it can be structured in how we do it. We have our two prompt questions. We ask the questions and just collect stories and information. Um, third tool that we have, our communication systems that are already in place in town. So um, the town sends out an email to people who sign up. The police department sends out an email to people to sign up. Um, we can certainly, you know, if folks want us to draft an email or that people can use as a template, but that's another way, send an email out to the public um, who have signed up for those communications, asking them for their input. And again, you know, what do you think the committee needs to know? And what are your hopes and expectations of the committee? Um, and the last thing we can do is kind of hold a catch all open meeting in October for anyone in town who's interested. Um, we all know these th events typically attract a certain type of person who might have an ax to grind or people who aren't paying attention, just don't wanna come, but it's up to us to spread the word and you know get people who we think care about this and have um, interesting opinions and are thoughtful, mindful, intentional, get them to attend. So um, we'd be curious to hear what people think about that. Well, I just, I, I'm going to, since I don't see anybody speaking yet, I just wanted to say thank you, Susan, for sort of pulling all of that together. That was like a lot in a small space. And I, I, I know that I have said this to you privately, but uh, I'm going to say it through the whole committee. I'm not sure if everybody's totally, completely aware that what Susan does in her like real professional life is communications and helping people and organizations think about how to get these messages out. And so I think we're really lucky to have her expert opinions or ideas or experience help us think about how to, how we can make use of the very short amount of time that we have in a, as efficiently and effectively as possible. Thank you, Laura. I think Carlos had a, his hand up. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you again. I mean, I, I think I'm, I'm a visual person, Susan. So yeah. if you can just send me the bullets <laughs> with the yes, plan. Yes. I think they were fantastic. I, I, I think you're, you're, you're taking advantage of what we already have, you know, yeah. in here to not create extra, extra work, but just create, you know, the structure, you know, like the people that have already natural constituencies go out down, reach out, and then all the way to, to basically trying to do the outreach to those that maybe they're hard to 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 get to 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 voice themselves and then of course the, the full open meeting i think i think all of them catches a lot of the the pieces so i think it's just crazy so my, my question now is like how do we do it how, how do we now implement this or or i mean i want to hear about other people thoughts about you know comments but i think it's how, how do we do it i have thoughts on that I mean, I, I have thoughts on that too. And, yeah, and I think, right, yeah. I think Susan has, has laid out for the three of them are, are fairly straightforward, yeah. right? The, the commissions, the holding a public meeting, um, and I'm forgetting what the third one was. Right, the, emails. The, oh, yes, emails. The, the, and soliciting written feedback to us, right? The, the hard one is going out to individual communities, right? And, I, I, you know, that's hard. Um, and there's a reason it's hard. And that's a reason that, almost nobody succeeds at doing it, um, but we can do our very best to do it. And, and I think, I mean, I don't know what Susan has in mind, right? But, well, I don't know. I'll let Susan say what she has in mind. <laughs> <laughs> what I have in mind is um, 
basically going to Jill Harvey and picking her brain for all of the organi organizing she's done in town already. Um, but um, I mean, Arlington has had pretty high profile events from faith communities in response to swastikas, you know, and who organized those? I, and I know I'm now talking in a way that irritates the crap out of me when people start, this meeting's recorded, I need to self-censor. Um, when people just start talking off the top of their head with ideas, but there are people who are connected with various communities, certainly with immigrants and refugees in town, that's a really strong community. Um, but can, can I just say sort of invite and ask? Yeah, yeah. yeah but okay. I think we sort of have to write the time is now right we have yeah. to make our decisions as a, a committee I think, I mean, what what I would sort of like to see right is us maybe perhaps I don't know, divide up into pairs right and say okay this pair is in charge of reaching out to X, Y and or Z right and they can they are um, in charge of making those connections and soliciting that feedback and bringing that feedback back to the to the whole committee because I don't think right we can't do all of those individual things as a full committee no. for logistical reasons and because I don't think that that would be appropriate for meeting with a lot of those different kinds of communities right yeah. um, so I think you know perhaps if people could well people could indicate that that they don't want to volunteer. Otherwise you could perhaps divide us up into pairs and assign us, um, assign us some, I, and, but we should ask people to comment on that. But I, I'd like to, that's sort of my, what I sort of would like to see. Yep, I second that. I see a few head nods, but it'd be really nice to hear from some people verbally. Well, one thing that I like about this idea is that if we're if we divide into smaller groups, it makes the task of trying to get as much of this done by October ish more doable because we're not all trying to coordinate all these different meetings. And I also think it allows us to kind of be more tailored as we reach out to these communities or people we think are good into the communities in terms of what, how they think, like what is the best format for talking to uh, the, like an immigrants community or any of any of the communities. So I, I think this is a good idea and I would hope that we'd get a lot of volunteers from, from us. So absent anyone like proactively volunteering, can we just assume everyone is willing if they get an email from Laura and I, oh, Carlos is giving a thumbs up. Uh, Michael, yeah. Elliot, yes. And um, like in pairs and just assign you, all right, you have faith, veterans, police, et cetera. Um, okay. So that's what we'll do. Can I just note on the, yeah. on the part of the professional sort of staff on the committee, I, I'm at your disposal, uh, but I, I'm sensitive to the fact that, you know, might have a more specific role. So I, I'm, again, would trust the chairs and to make a decision about what would make sense for, for our time. But I'm, I'm available for whatever you guys would like me to Terrific. Thank you. I'm also happy to coordinate however I can. And I just wanted to comment on your original presentation. I know we've been talking about it a lot in different avenues, and I really like um, having all of those avenues um, as I stated before, we respond to approximately 30,000 calls a year, and we have a lot of interactions with people and um, using um, town emails that are already in place and going out and talking to people, I think will solicit um, people um, with opinions who've had actual interactions with the police department. So thank you very much. <laughs> Which is an important base of knowledge. Um, Okay, I, I don't know if we have to vote on this or or we can just move on to the next item, but it feels like we have a plan in place, but I'm gonna reality check with Sanjay. Does this sound to you, Sanjay, like you've got to- I don't know why I'm the authority on that, but- 
I think it sounds good. I think okay. that it sounds like we have agreement amongst folks here. I don't think that we need to formally vote on any of that uh, unless Doug really is the one who should tell us whether we need to vote on it. And I don't think we need to. He's shaking his head. I think you're okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Then the next item is um, sort of a communications update. And again, this is a, a, a theme and a thread that runs that has run through our last few meetings. So just wanted to give an update and some ideas. Um, as of today, about half of our meetings, unfortunately, we lost some of the first ones, but about half of our meetings are now available on the ACMI channel. Sanjay was interviewed by ACMI's James Milan about the presentation he made to the committee, even though it hasn't aired yet. Um, and we're soon going to publish the interim report to the town website, um, along with a lot of other information that I think interested members of the public will find interesting, which is some of the documents that we've been referencing, other out external sources. Some of those have already been posted to our web page on the town website, and we have more that are coming. Um, but folks have really been talking about, and I'm really thinking of Carlos because you keep talking about a brochure, Carlos. So really like user-friendly ways to share what we're learning. Um, Elliot is another one. You've been really clear, like how am I gonna talk to this when I'm back at school to other students who are interested in this. Um, so towards that end, I, I've gone ahead and I've drafted some short blog posts that are pulled from the interim report. Um, so I've got a post on what various civilian oversight models are, um, a post on investigative oversight models, the history of civilian oversight, what other communities in Massachusetts are doing. Um, we have a lot of information from other reports that have been published in Lexington. We've talked about that report. We've got reports from Newton, Somerville, Springfield, Pittsfield, and Boston. Um, so, you know, with those little posts, we can certainly ask the advocate in your Arlington to publish them. We can share them on Arlington community groups on Facebook, um, and then take cover because it's Facebook. Um, laughs at my jokes. Um, we would in person. We're all just okay. muted. Susan. <laughs> I laughed. I was muted. Okay, and the other thing we can do, uh, like again, utilizing town newsletters. Would, you, would any town entity ever wanna share some of these shorter bite-sized things? We have learned some interesting things. Um, would the town be open to us writing short little social media posts? Like, hey, check out this blog post about what our police civilian study board advisory committee I probably mangled the name of our title, is doing, maybe the police department would be willing to share some of these on their social media channels. I don't know. We're learning a lot. A lot of people in town are interested in this. It, this seems like a pretty easy way to um, share this. And then the last thing I would do, and again, this goes to- Jill's got her hands up before we go to oh, the last okay, thing. okay, sorry. I'm going to say with all of that, if you have like um blog posts all of that that can go on the committee page on the town website Excellent. so um Good. like if there's little videos they we would just need to convert everything to a vimeo account but yeah. all of that can go on there um and then things like on my page can redirect to that as well so that's Excellent. definitely an option okay so that's that's just a super easy way to share it's not soliciting information which is a really important piece of what we need to do but it is pushing out what we've been learning um and does anybody have any like reaction or concerns or questions about that doug your hand is up well first let me echo my appreciation for all the thought and planning that's gone into this and the skill with which you've developed it without without a lot of time um i think it sounds like a terrific plan i i'm gonna be um just lawyer doug for just one moment and advise everybody with respect to social media that the open meeting law applies to social media discourse so when you're on a facebook thread when you're on a twitter thread if you discuss the substance of what's the charge before your committee that could be an open meeting law violation. so just try to be cognizant of that um, if everybody's like in a Facebook group and you start discussing a matter where it's within your jurisdiction among a quorum of you, okay. unlikely given the size of this committee, but I just want you guys to all be cautious about 
reacting, talking, answering questions is, is maybe one thing, but getting into a discourse with each other is something to just be aware of in the social media context. Okay, yeah. I guess the place that that might happen is Facebook, but it's hard to imagine a quorum coming together on that, but that's Agreed. a really important reminder. Well, I think it's, I think it sounds great. Okay. Any other responses or reactions? I think it sounds great. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. I okay. like having these things also as pushing out as much of it as makes sense without overloading everybody. The sort of, as we also organize these other feedback interactions, because the more context that we provide, you know, to people who may not take the time to read the entire report or, you know, whatever, I think the more the more productive those listening sessions or meetings can be. Yep. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, can I say one thing? I apologize, Sandra, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I, I, that is something I should have said. I will hope that whatever, um, whatever you guys post out there, I would hope that you would make sure to have a link to that full report. Because one of the things that I have seen mostly in the context of zoning is that when we talk about zoning matters, there's a lot of folks who, and understandably, it totally makes sense that like everybody's only got so much time in the day, zoning can be an especially dense subject, but there's a lot of really important stuff in those details. And sometimes I, I just think that you, you guys have drafted a really nice um, uh, draft report. I, I would just make sure that, that, that that's accessible in all of these sort of postcard ideas or blog posts but there's always a link to that report. Maybe you guys are automatically already thinking about that. Maybe, I'm sorry if I missed that. But, but I, I really hope that people will read the full thing because without reading, without reading it all, it's not going to do a service to the work of, of, of this committee and all of the things that you guys have thought about and are thinking about now. I wasn't explicit about it, but each of the posts that I've written now all have multiple links back oh, okay, to, the, to the full report. So... Yeah if somebody trips down a rabbit hole, they're gonna land in the interim report. So. Yeah. And, and that's sort of, I was gonna say a similar thing in that, you know, as much work as we can do now to bring people, you know, whether that's town meeting members or people in town, right? Along on this journey with us, right? Of what we're learning, of what we're, how we're coming to our recommendations, right? As, long, as much as we can bring people along with us so that we're not, at town meeting dumping a report on their right on their desk so to speak um right and and saying okay here read read all these words that that you don't understand yet um so so i think as much as we can bring people along i think that's a really important job for us to be doing so um yeah and that's it Maybe um, that's the end of my update. Okay. Uh, let me just take a look back at our agenda, which has disappeared. Oh, here it is. Um, we don't have anything else on the agenda. I have but... two sort of new, new little new business things. Um, if you don't okay. mind, would that be no, okay? Go ahead. Uh, so, in the similar vein to what Susan has done. I've written what we had talked about as an executive summary. I have a sort of rough draft of that, um, which I'd love to circulate to all of you before our next meeting. Um, you know, it's kind of a maybe like one and a half, two page version of our final report. Maybe that's too, we'll see, we can compare with Susan's blog post and maybe it's too, it's the same thing and we can pick um, hers probably. <laughs> No, but people uh, don't hear anything until you've said it seven times. Yeah, so we can, well, we'll see. We can, we can perhaps uh, do both. The other thing that I sort of had, there was a question last time uh, about sort of the context of the creation of this committee at town meeting and select board and all that sort of stuff. And so um, I've been sort of thinking about my recollections of all of that as since I'm one of the town meeting members appointed to the committee. And so I'll, I'll put together a memo um, for folks who don't have that, who don't have that history, um, oh, that, so that, that 
because I think people were asking people were asking about that and sort of how it fits into the work that we have to do. Um, and I think that's come up a couple of different times over the course of our meetings. So I'll, I'll put together a memo um, for yeah. before our next meeting for folks. Um, I also real just realized that I don't know if we've if we have told the whole committee about our guest speaker for our next meeting, Susan. Did you want to give people the heads um, I, up? I can't about? recall. Um, and this was Chief Flaherty's idea. We're going to, we have um, confirmed that Chief uh, Michael Wynn of Pittsville, Mass Police Department, who is one of nine people appointed to the post commission um, working on the state law, is going to come to us and talk about his experiences with the Pittsfield um, civilian board and how that works and whatnot and answer any questions we might have. Maybe he'll answer some post questions for us too. <laughs> <laughs> we can ask whatever we want, I think. And he will be at our next meeting. So. Which is uh, Monday, September 20th for everyone who doesn't, if you do not have an, I will send out uh, the Zoom link for that. It's, I've already, it's already on the town calendar, but I don't think I've sent it out to everyone here. Um, does Laura, anybody Jillian, have... Jillian has her hand up. Oh, okay. Just real quick. I know earlier in the meeting, there was um, a question about feedback from the commissions. And I think Kathy, you said they'd be meeting before this next meeting. That's actually not the case. Um, the disability rainbow and human rights got pushed back to the week of the 20th because of Yom Kippur. So okay. we won't have updates from those groups. <laughs> Just so it'll be October. <laughs> Thank you. Which raises one last thing, right? I'll, I'll send a ditto, uh, I'll send a poll for um, our future, our future meetings. Um, I assume that we'll set up two, attempt to set up two for October, one of which will be the community input meeting and one of which will be a um, regular business meeting. Yep. Is that reasonable? I see some nods, okay. That makes sense. Anne is giving a thumbs up. And Great. I can almost see everyone at this point. Can I move that um, we adjourn? Am I, am I over my skis? No, I, I was going to ask if anybody wanted to move to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Second. On a motion by uh, Sanjay, seconded by, was that Kathy? Yes. Um, <clears throat> Bob? Yes. Elliot? Yes. Carlos. Yes. Michael. Yes. Mona. Yes. Anne. Yes. Clarissa. I think she left. Okay. Uh, Kathy. Yes. Sanjay. Yes. Susan. Yes. Laura. Yes. I think I got everybody. Anybody missing anybody? It's an unanimous vote. Good night, Thank folks. you. Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Everything. Good night, folks.